All right, recording has started, Dave. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Welcome to the York School Committee meeting on this Wednesday, June 2nd, 2021. We've had some technical difficulties that are not permitting us to broadcast live on Channel 3 and Town Hall streams. We are, in fact, recording it and we'll post it uh, as soon as we're uh, able to. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to engage in social distancing, public attendance is, is not permitted. Public participation through agenda items F and J public comment is desired by either emailing me ahead of this meeting or calling 207-363-3403 extension 10016. With that, I'll call the meeting to order and ask us to pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, recognition, Superintendent. Yes, thank you, Chairman Irvine. Um, I welcome uh, Whitney Thornton here tonight. Um, she uh, is going to be honored tonight. Um, and I'm going to read something from you from the president of the Maine School Nutrition Association for 2020-21. Her name's Alyssa Roman. And um, Whitney uh, has received the distinction of being the uh, School Nutrition Services Director of the Year. So with that, I'm gonna read what was said about her. Every year, a director in Maine is chosen to be awarded the Maine School Nutrition Director of the Year. The process involves the nomination of the director to the National School Nutrition Association. Winners are chosen by the state association. It is with my deepest pleasure to announce that the 2020-2021 State Child Nutrition Director of the Year for the state of Maine has been awarded to Whitney Thornton from the York School Department. Whitney has been a valued member of the Maine School Nutrition Association and has demonstrated leadership at not only a district, but state level. Her innovative ideas have helped other districts around, around her think outside of the box. Through COVID-19 pandemic, Whitney has again gone above and beyond to provide meals to school and community. I can think of no better person to be receiving this honor. We will be acknowledging Whitney's award at our annual conference in August in Augusta. Congratulations to Whitney and the York School Department for the continued support of child nutrition in the state of Maine. So Whitney, we're very proud of you. Congratulations, well-deserved. Thank you, thank you. And I, I just wanted to mention, I, we hit the trifecta with Whitney uh, earlier this year. Anita Bernhardt was the Assistant Superintendent of the Year and Mike Bennett <laughs> was the, is the, I'm sorry, is, she still is, Mike Bennett is the uh, vice uh, principal of the year. So Whitney, thanks for hitting, help, helping us hit the trifecta. I'm so proud of uh, the administrative staff. Well-deserved. Um, Thank you. So I'm not gonna put you on a spot and have you do any, any, any speech <laughs> anyway, because you're a very humble person. All right, uh, the next area that I want to get into for recognitions is uh, some athletic recognitions. Um, the boys and girls track teams won their conference uh, meets last Saturday. Uh, they are both undefeated. Uh, the state championship for track is this Saturday. If you're interested in going, it's going to be held at the McMahon Field in Bath, Maine. So it's up north. Uh, but congratulations to our track athletes and coaches. And I'm going to name the coaches. Sadie Schaefer, Schaefer Merrick, Ted Hutch, Missy Freeman, Kevin Wyatt, Matt Weber, Stan Cohen, Candace Jaffe, and Roger Clements. Uh, so congratulations to the track teams. Also, all, all other athletic teams are in the playoffs, and the playoff brackets will be set this Friday. So once I get more information, I'll share that out in, in terms of how successful our, our athletes have, will be in the playoffs. So wanted to just mention that tonight. In the third area, I want to recognize some uh, recognitions for our graduates from the San Sanford Regional Technical Center. Uh, we had 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven students go through the program over in Sanford. And I want to mention uh, the following. Um, Trevor Basarash, he completed the welding and metal fabrication program. Um, Jacob Bean uh, completed the precision, precision manufacturing. Uh, he also got an award for outstanding attendance. Uh, in the area of health occupations, uh, Juliana Carroll uh, uh, completed her program. And in building trades, uh, Justin Laverde uh, from York, uh, he also uh, got an awesome attendance award. Uh, in electrical wiring, William Papp, uh, he completed his program at, with honors. And two more, the auto collision repair program was completed by Jesse Stobie. And finally, uh, Megan Tui completed health occup occupations and she uh, received high honors and is a member of the National Technical Honor Society. So congratulations to those students for a job well done uh, at the Stanford Regional Technical Center. So really, they, they were uh, recognized uh, uh, on Thursday, uh, May 27th. So congratulations to those uh, students. So that's all I have for uh, recognitions tonight. So it's always a pleasure to give you the great news. So with that, I'm, I'm done with the recognitions. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I just want to echo uh, the, the congratulations to the uh, uh, Sanford Region of Technical students. Uh, that is not an easy route. There is almost nothing convenient about it, and we've continued to try to work to increase our enrollment there. Uh, but those that have uh, managed to persevere and uh, graduate are, are certainly be, to be congratulated. So that's all for that. Um, our next item is uh, approval of minutes. We have two sets. Uh, we will take them individually because not all of us were there for the first set. And I have another uh, reason for doing that. So I'll make a motion to approve the April 19th meeting minutes with the following revised paragraph eight. There were just some word difficulties in there and uh, people not accurately described. So here's what, here's how paragraph eight should read in, in my amendment. Village Elementary School Principal Beth Hutchins, along with Inclusion Advisory Group Committee uh, uh, member Joanne Myers and member Julie Enneman shared their perspectives and the history of equity, diversity, and inclusion work being done in the schools with students and staff. Member Schmidt and Assistant Superintendent Bernhardt, also an IAG member, added their thoughts on the positive steps being taken in this important work. And I will forward that paragraph to Liz and Sue after this meeting. Uh, I will second, but I just wanted to clarify, this is uh, for the May 19th minutes. Dave, I believe you said April 19th. So just to clarify, oh, this is May 19th. Good. Yeah, I'm sorry, May 19th, correct. And I'll Any, second though. Okay. Any further discussion on the May 19th minutes? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Um, I think you should abstain. Oh. You, weren't, you weren't there. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, Tom? Abstain. Uh, Meredith? Yes. And chair votes yes. Motion carries three, zero, two abstentions. Sort of a rocky start to our minutes here. I'll take a motion now for the uh, May 24th emergency meeting minutes. I motion to approve the May 20, or excuse me, the May 19th, 20. No, May 24th. Sorry, Dave, I caught your bug. I make a motion to approve the May 24th, 2021 emergency um, minutes, emergency meeting minutes. I'll second. 
Any discussion on the May 24th minutes? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5-0 to approve the May 24th minutes. Thank you. Uh, next item is communications. Upcoming meetings on uh, tomorrow evening, we have the pleasure of uh, attending the adult education graduation at the work York Community Auditorium at 6 p.m. Uh, June 8th is the high school convocation in virtual mode only. June 9th is our school committee training workshop at seven o'clock. I've been in contact with Steve Bailey uh, finalizing the agenda for that. There will be an invitation coming out uh, from either I or Steve. I'm not sure which uh, software we're going to use yet. Um, June 10th is the high school banquet and senior video night. And June 11th is the high school graduate. And I think that's it. Superintendent. Thank you, Dave. Um, there are no donations to bring forward tonight. I just, you know, this is a standing item on the agenda. Typically, we have donations that come in periodically, but I have none to report tonight. Um, the second item on my report is the superintendent's update on school operations during COVID-19. Um, in your committee packet, it was sent out on Friday, uh, still included uh, the final draft of health and safety, pr safety procedures. procedures. Um, uh, revisions were made to the current plan based on M Maine Department of Education updates and input from the Health and Safety Committee, which met on Thursday, May 6, 2021. And um, just for the new committee members, uh, that committee was composed of medical folks from York Hospital. Uh, we have teachers, administrators, and parents on that committee. Uh, that committee was instrumental last year uh, when we developed the reopening plans for health and safety. Um, so what we did was we reconvened that committee on May 6th and uh, went through the current plan and cross-referenced it with some of the changes that are being recommended by the Maine Department of Education. And uh, so we had to go at that. Um, so what you see is the final draft. We're, I'm going to be meeting with the Health and Safety Committee on Tuesday, June 8th, just for a final review of the document. And um, I'm just gonna go over some of the highlights for you. It's a pretty lengthy um, document, but essentially um, there are some requirements that the state of Maine um, has us follow with regard to a number of areas. One is screening. Uh, I don't know if you folks had a chance to look through this, uh, but there are questions that we ask when it comes to screening and a protocol in place for that. Uh, our nurses are very familiar with that. Um, another second area of the plan is hand hygiene, hand washing, and hand sanitizing. Um, three is wearing masks. Four is physical distancing. And five would be food service. Uh, six is facilities. Uh, and then we have a section seven on coordination and communication. Um, some of you may have seen communication that we put out this year around COVID quick notes and updates regarding any outbreaks, uh, keeping people current and up to date on what's happening. Uh, we have a section on transportation, uh, training, and then uh, nurse facilities in response to presumed and confirmed cases of COVID-19. And then we have a section of appendices, the various documents that the committee looked at um, as we went through and revised uh, the um, procedures. So with that, um, I just you know want to again, thank the committee uh, for its work that it's done and um, feeling pretty upbeat about where we're headed uh, right now. Um, you know, we're still following the guidance from the from the state of Maine, the Department of Education, Health and Human Services, and uh, we'll continue to do so as long as the you know pandemic's around. And I think we're going to have to keep implementing these health and safety procedures for some for the for the near future, um, as you know, it's fall approaches in winter. We may be battling cases again. So with that, I don't know if you folks have any questions. Um, I can certainly take your feedback and share it with the committee. Uh, when we meet um, next week. Tom? 
Just a quick question around vaccination. I didn't, it may be listed in there, Lou, but I didn't catch it. Uh, I know more and more people are getting uh, fully vaxxed. Is that gonna make a difference for the fall? That's gonna make a huge difference. Uh, right now, um, we have, uh, we've, we've, we held a vaccination clinic, uh, I think it was about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks now, at our schools, at the middle school and at the high school. Um, the vast majority of our um, high school students are vaccinated. And then we had a high number of students at the middle school ages 12 and up that were vaccinated. I'm hoping that uh, we'll start to see vaccinations for younger children. Um, and, and that, you know, with that, um, I, I'm hoping there'll be some light at the end of the tunnel. So that's a great question, Tom. Um, we're advocating that folks do that. Of course, it's not a requirement. Uh, the state doesn't require that. It's an opt-in for parents, uh, but uh, that it's helping us out. I know it's helped the staff out tremendously uh, in terms of um, relieving their stress and, and worry. Any other questions about the, uh, the health and safety procedures? Maybe not a maybe not a fair one, but I'll ask it anyway. Lou, do you think there's going to be any updated revised guidance coming out of the state uh, before we come back to school in September? I hope. I, I ask that question just about every Friday when I meet with the York County Superintendents Association. We have reps from the Department of Education that show up. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we'll get some updates, particularly around masking. Um, we'll see, you know, what happens uh, right now. You know, what I'm hearing is that they're in place till the end of the school year and through the summer. But, um, you know, there's a lot of mixed messages that's out there in the field right now, particularly around, uh, for example, I'll just give an example. The Maine Principals Association are letting uh, wrestlers wrestle without masks. And so superintendents are asking if that can occur, then why is there an issue with masking or be having six foot distancing when it comes to eating. So there's a lot of questions in the field right now. And there's a lot of different uh, agencies that are involved that have different views on, uh, on masking in particular. Uh, but right now, the way it stands is that masks are in place right now for in, in, indoors in our schools and then uh, looking like that's gonna continue through the summer. But if any changes occur, Dave, uh, you'll be one of the first to know. Yeah, so the, so the guidelines that we're talking about here are, in fact, based on what we know and what we have in hand today, not on what we think is going to occur, right? Correct. That's and, not and, what we Yes, yes. All right. Any other members have any questions for Lou on the health and safety guidelines? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. That brings me to my next item. It's the... Um, the strategic planning guide that it was also included in your packet. Um, the, um, this guide was created um, based on information received from um, the um, organization that does school accreditation as well as feedback from faculty, staff, and the administration. Uh, the document has been shared with school personnel in the district's blue book, and the plan will go on our websites. Um, and I'm just going to go over some of the highlights of this one as well. Uh, I direct your attention to page one. Page one talks about uh, the vote on May 19th. Uh, the York School Committee approved details um, related to the beginning of our next district-wide strategic planning process. Uh, this document provides information about the process so we can keep our entire York School Department community informed. So based on the feedback that we received from faculty and staff, we decided to delay um, the full Im implementation of the strategic plan to give folks time to get back, get back to normal, and, and then we, we're going to really kick this in fully after the new year. And, you know, the feedback we were getting from the staff is that they just want to get back to work in the fall and get things underway. And then during, between the fall and then and the, after the new year, we'll have some, some committee work being done, but not extensive work during that time period. Uh, on page two, uh, it provides an overview of the, um, the overview of the process. Um, what we're going to do is implement the full uh, strategic planning process, like I said, after January 1st, 2022, 
but we are going to establish a strategic planning uh, steering committee uh, by June 15, 2021. And uh, we've had some teachers already asked to volunteer. And um, in this document, it, it talks about the different positions that are open. Um, we also will establish a standards reflection uh, committee uh, by October 30th, 2021. And there's some steps involved with that as well. But we really wanna get the committees, particularly the, the um, steering committee up and in, in, in operational uh, by June 15th, and there'll be some training involved. And so we wanna have those people in, on board as soon as we can so they can participate in the training. Uh, page three talks about the accreditation process, a uh, vision for learning. And, and there are some there are, there are five key components in the process. Uh, one is the self-reflection completed by the school. Um, and then there'll be a collaborative conference held with a small team of peer educators coming in from the outside. Uh, we will then develop and implement a school growth plan. And then there's a reflective uh, summary report completed by the school. And then there's the personalized uh, decen decennial accreditation visit. So that really is the process uh, for the um, strategic planning. And then on page four, um, it, it talks about the um, composition of the York School Department Steering and Standard Reflections Committee, as well as the five standard teams. So we'll have educators on the five standard teams. We'll have educators and faculty and, and administrators and other folks on the steering as well as the reflection uh, standard reflection committee. Uh, page five shows you a timeline, again, spelling out where we're going to begin with the formation of the steering committee in June and then um, moving on down the road. Um, page six, um, there's some vocabulary that we thought was important to communicate out, some key vocabulary related to the process. I'm not going to get into reading all that information. Again, we'll have this up on our website, uh, but that's in, in the packet that we gave you. Um, and then some major themes related to the process on page seven. And then when you get on to page eight, um, talks about the standards for uh, accreditation and the foundational elements associated with these standards. Um, I'll just mention the five standards are learning culture, student learning, professional practice, learning support, and learning resources. And they're spelled out uh, in the document. And then, uh, when you get to page uh, nine and 10, there's um, the standards are defined on those pages. The five standards are defined on pages nine to 10. And then when we get to page 11, there's a, some frequently asked questions uh, that um, we put in the document itself. So the staff, we've shared this on our blue book. Uh, it's a place where staff can go and find the information. It's been communicated out that that's where the strategic planning guide is located. We will also put this up on our school websites to let the public know what we're up to. And um, with that, uh, I'm going to stop uh, and see if there's any questions. Um, I, I don't know if you have anything you wanna add, Anita. Anita's been working with me, um, kind of facilitating this uh, process. I think you're muted. Thank you. Um, I think the only thing I'd add is that um, I think we would, you know, we'll have additional things to share and it, it seems likely that we will have a COVID, next to me, a strategic planning page on the, on the website, similar to the COVID page that we produced with a, with a bunch of resources connected to that um, so that folks will be able to update themselves and kind of know as things move along and get, and get going where they can find information about that. We will give the committee updates as we move along. Um, you'll be hearing from us on the work that's being completed. And uh, again, we'll give you uh, periodic updates. Any questions from anybody else? I Dawn? just have one question. Um, so for the calendar on page five, it ends in October. I just wanted to clarify, does the beginning of the accreditation process, is that what begins after the first of the year? The, 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 the nuts and bolts, the intensive work begins after the, yes, after, after the new year. 
the um, October date is the formation of the standards reflection committees uh, committee, and then we'll train those folks at that time. But the the really down and dirty work will take place after the new year. Okay. Extensive work. Thank you. Tom, did you have a question? To, yeah, I was curious, is the growth, when you, you're talking about uh, the growth uh, mindset, is that based on Carol Dweck's work? Or is this a different uh, a thinking around those concepts? I'm just curious. Anita, you spoke with uh, NIAS reps. Can you give a brief overview of that? Yeah, it, it is a reference to Carol yeah. Dweck's work, that notion that it's a, a continuous growth mindset is really the, the idea that schools should be um, using that way of thinking to think about their personal growth. All right, so it's take, so we're taking it out of the individual self-reflection mode and then applying it to the entire organization and then seeing where it is that maybe the York School District's getting in its own way uh, or perhaps it has a fixed mindset about a, a given concept that needs to be opened, if I'm interpreting that correctly. I, I, think, that, I think that's a fair interpretation. Um, there's not quite that much detail um, uh, on the NIASC website, but I think it's a pretty fair interpretation. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> okay, thank you. So the next item on my report, I'm gonna yield time to uh, Assistant Superintendent Anita Bernhardt. She's gonna give an update on the inclusion advisory group recommendations. Um, and I think the date is wrong there. I think it's uh, 2021, not 2001 on the agenda. Yep. 2021. Take a, a flashback here to 2001. Um, so uh, uh, I, I shared um, the report with all of you. Um, I'm going to highlight some of the, um, the most significant pieces of it, but feel free to ask questions when I get done. Um, uh, as you as you may or may not know, um, during the 2020, um, the fall of 2020, and and into the spring of 2021, the York Incl Inclusion Advisory Group, which is the York School Department's Standing Committee on Inclusion, Equity, and Diversity, um, has been meeting regularly as it did in the prior year, and um, this year, consistent with last year the group has presented recommendations to the ongoing work related to equity, inclusion, and diversity. So um, the work um, that the, the group did this year was uh, unlike last year, which was really a kind of a broad think about um, what kinds of um, ideas in general should, should guide the, um, the district's work. This year, the group was strategically thinking about two recommendations that had been brought forward in the prior year. And that those two recommendations were related to the idea of um, the uh, of looking more carefully at the data that we have that can inform our actions related to in uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and also um, to think about the um, moving forward this idea of a an equity curriculum audit. So uh, the the group um, met long hours, and I have to say, uh, some groups are more persistent than others, and this one proved to be quite persistent because we had a series of meetings that were uh, had to be canceled on the spur of the moment because there wasn't any electricity or because the internet debt was down because there were high winds. I mean, it was one week after another of of pushing this off. But um, I'm 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 happy to say that um, uh, the the group as a whole was really um, st stuck to their guns and continued to, um, to push forward in the conversations. Um, so let me tell you um, about the, I'm gonna skip um, into the recommendations. Um, let me tell you about the two, two groups of recommendations. The first that I wanna talk about is the curriculum 
uh, review work group recommendations. And that group recommends, and I, I do want to take hit pause for a second and say that this group is an advisory group. So the, they try to help the district to do very good thinking, but it is um, up to the district to decide how to act on the recommendations of the group. Um, so the um, curriculum review work group recommends to the district that the district um, conduct a comprehensive curriculum equity audit um, that included in that audit that there are three um, significant domains. The first is curriculum, the resources and materials that we use, books, um, uh, online resources, that, that sort of, um, those sorts of materials, relationships and culture. Um, and physical space. And I want to give you just a couple of examples of um, those things. So for example, um, with respect to curriculum and the group put together a series of questions, example questions that they think should be um, used to flavor the kind of audit that we do. So under curriculum, they suggested that one of the questions be, are teachers' classroom texts, activities, information, and examples culturally responsive to race, class, ethnicity, language, gender, or gender identity, religion, religion and disability. The second uh, category under this audit um, was proposed to be relationship and culture. And an example of a question that um, they have suggested might be asked in that area is, are expectations for students equitable, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, English language ability, disability status, gender identity, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status. Another example in that category might be, do district administrators promote and encourage the building of positive relationships and support networks for students? And the third category in that, um, in the Equi curriculum equity audit is um, physical space. And an example of a question that would drive that kind of examination is, does the signage and visual materials in buildings depict diversity in a variety of roles, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender language, gender language, disability status, gender identity, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status? So I hope that that provides you with just a sense of the kinds of questions and the scope of the um, of the audit that the that the inclusion advisory group is recommending. Should I let me just let me just continue on the recommendation. So the second half of the um, the other half of the inclusion advisory focused its attention on data and they spent some time looking at data and their recommendation to, to the district are uh, there are four of them. The first is that the um, in 2021-22, the York School Department should conduct a student educator and family climate and culture survey and focus groups. The um, second one, and I'll just add a side note that as part of our um, our uh, strategic planning, one of the components of that is some pretty extensive surveys. So just there's some there's some. Uh, uh, dovetailing that might be able to be done there. Second, during the summer that the YSD this summer would convene members of the inclusion advisory to start vetting survey and focus group instruments and that the areas of their um, uh, focus would be related to questions um, related to equity, diversity and inclusion, social emotional learning, family engagement and student voice, which they all thought which they thought were important um, questions that should be gathered to help inform our equity work. The third recommendation is that the York School Department will find individuals to lead a research and networking component to this work. And that is to say that they will, we will find individuals to help us understand what other communities similar to York are doing to spearhead um, their communities um, uh, in inclusion in their inclusion efforts. And the final recommendation from the data group is that um, the York School Department uh, should assess its diversity of faculty and staff as compared to its diversity of students and determine what steps could be taken to have those two profiles be more on a par. 
So now I will pause and ask if you have any questions about that. Tom. Uh, yeah, a couple. One, uh, I think everyone on the call knows that the town of York, the selectmen put forth a proclamation over the summer, which deals with a lot of these similar subjects. And I know there's been a little bit of uh, crosstalk, but I'm curious, uh, Anita, if part of the work as well in what the school district is is about to undertake is also going to include reaching over to um, the selectmen and, and, you know, basically saying, here's where we're at. What have you done? How can we come together collectively? Secondly, for teachers. I love the fact that we're we're uh, putting a lot of energy on our students. That's crucial, as well as uh, the families of our students. But I, I also I, I didn't specifically see uh, things listed here for teachers themselves. So that if I happen to be teaching at the York, any York school, that I would feel that that same um, inclusion. Um, um, let me take the first. Not sure. Not sure where. Did I disappear? No, okay. I'm echoing out of somebody else's speaker, but it seems to have stopped. That's great. Um, so let me take the first one first. Um, we have, uh, Dave and I have met with the town's group. And um, in the last correspondence that we had with them, we suggested that we co-develop an agenda so that we could think about the kinds of uh, work that each group were doing to be able to dovetail efforts. I, I, um, I, I, the groups are two separate organizations. So um, I think that, you know, having, we talked at a previous meeting about the importance of having um, understanding the, the, the having common language for talking about this work, understanding the kinds of data that we were examining because that would assist us in understanding the work that each of those organizations were doing as well and um, and and sharing strategies for the way that we were going about analyzing data in particular. Um, so and, and training, um, providing any kinds of training supports for staff. So we I, you know, talked about that as uh, appropriate steps, but ha nothing else at this point has been done to move that forward. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And you asked another question, my apologies. Um, teachers, so could you say a little bit more about that? Could you um, articulate a little bit more? Yeah, I, so I'm, I'm thinking- a lot of teachers in this group. Right, so I'm thinking about it from the, the standpoint that if, if I happen to be, and, and I'm not, but if I was a teacher, in the York school system, and I was a, uh, in one of the identified categories, a, a diverse category. And then we all know that we, um, we have uh, some individuals in, in the teaching staff who, who may uh, fit some of these uh, identified groups. Do I also, not only am I supporting students, which of course I would be doing as a, as a, uh, a teacher, but I am also getting reinforced and supported by uh, the school district as well. Uh, and I know um, that uh, part of what I can add to the richness of the dialogue is my own experience. I mean, there's something about that that you know you just can't. Uh, it's pretty rich. So I I love the fact that from the get go, the 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 group has really focused on our key. Uh, constituents, which of course are the students, but we also want to ensure that the teachers as well feel that same yep. kind of um, outreach. I sort of where I'm going. If yeah. you, I'm going to uh, direct you on page uh, three to the very first one, the um, that uh, those surveys and focus groups are intended to include students, educators, and um, families. So I think that I think that it's addressed there, um, but I, I I'm not saying that we shouldn't take a careful look to make sure that we've done adequate work. But I know that that it includes all three groups there, and that would also include the um, the uh, uh, second piece, which is the development of questions that would help to support that. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Anyone else? I have one, in, uh, Anita. Uh, the uh, curriculum audit is that going to be internally with external help 
a little of each or neither. Uh, when Lou, Lou, do you want to address that? You want me to? You're on mute, though. Go ahead. You can summarize the conversation we had yeah. with GP. Yeah, yeah, we had we had a um, a conversation, Lou and I, and then we've been um, talking with others as well. The idea would be to have someone else come in and look at us for us, so that um, you know we got a a, a, a a more impartial view. There's, I mean, you can't be completely impartial, but um, we thought that it would be good to employ some uh, an external group. And haven't there's we haven't landed on a group, but um, right. we thought it would be a good idea to bring somebody outside in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Go on. I'm just wondering the summary of work and recommendations. Is that available for the public to read somewhere? Um, it isn't yet. We decided to wait until after this meeting tonight. Um, but we have made the recommendations um, in the past available on the website. Um, so we will certainly do that again. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any. Okay. Thank you, Anita. Chairman Irvine, um, would it be possible, uh, for some reason, uh, I wanted to have Whitney, and she didn't, it's not on the agenda. I wanted Whitney to put in a plug for the Summer Foods Program. Uh, would the committee and allow, allow us to do that? It's only going to take a couple of minutes here. Is that, is that okay to do? Uh, yeah, I'll take a, a motion to add that to the agenda. I move to add an update to the summer f uh, meals program to the agenda. I don't know what our item is. Where are we at? You could make it four and then we'll just carry on with the other two for five and six. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, yep. So for the motion that it enters under E2, four, or excuse me, A, E4, sorry. I'll second. Any discussion on adding that item to the agenda? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5 0. Welcome back, uh, Whitney. And uh, if you could just do. Uh, just put a plug in for free and reduced lunches in the summer program. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you guys very much. I just wanted to say that um, our summer meal, we're going to do summer meals again. Um, they are free for everyone, 18 and under. Um, so even your two-year-old, these common questions I get, yes, your two-year-old can also get the meals as well. Um, you do not need to sign up and um, you are not taking away from anyone else. Some people are afraid they might be taking away from someone else. No one was taking away from anyone else. Um, and we'll be doing it out of the middle school because they have a great roundabout. That way we can keep our um, food cold and we can run back to the kitchen if we need to, to grab stuff. And it will be Mondays and Wednesdays. And the first day will be July 5th and um, 11 to 12. Just drive up. No need to sign up or anything like that. And then... Um, as for the free and reduced applications, so next school year, 2021 and 2022, all breakfast and lunch is free for all students, again, and you do not, no one has to specifically sign up, but we're encouraging everyone to still do the free and reduced applications because, um, and the, that is starting July 1, you can fill out the new application. Um, and that helps funding for our program, funding for the school district, any school district that people are in. Um, and you, it also gives someone um, discounted internet for with Spectrum, and you get different waivers for college um, applications and field trips and whatnot. So we really encourage people to um, to still fill that out. And that's all. Thank you for letting me say that. <laughs> Whitney, thank you for doing that public service announcement and. I know you've communicated this out and we'll continue to communicate it out to the parents and, and guardians. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna move on. I'm going to introduce uh, our special education administrator, um, Ms. Roz Moriarty. She's gonna talk briefly about um, the 2020-21 audit by the Maine Department of Education. 
uh, the special education monitoring team. Welcome, Roz, and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Um, and I apologize that people could not open my links. So Anita is going to share the few slides I made so that she can open the links so you can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, and I also apologize for just getting this out to you. I got the actual report yesterday at the end of the day. So this is hot off the press. Um, so the although the uh, audit was this year, began in the fall, um, we were looking at the previous year's data from August 2019 through March 2020. That was the time the timeline they gave us to pull the um, the IEPs from and the data for the eligibility and so forth. In looking at this, the the monitoring team were looking at referral information, how many referrals, the timelines, um, the eligibility, again, the timelines, the 45 school day timeline, and um, the written notices that go out, the, the information they carry in them, and then a lot of information from the IEPs, including data, um, measurable goals, uh, the, the percentage of time in the least restrictive environment, um, the amount of evaluation data, and did it line up with the goals? So the, the I, they were looking to see whether the IEPs match the evaluation data and then was linked through the different sections of the IEPs. Um, so this process began with the letter last September, training in October for me, and then um, by January, I had to send them randomly selected uh, IEPs. And from the randomly se selected IEPs, they pulled the, some of the eligibility data and referral and transition data. So everything had to be linked. We also had to send them all of the um, new referrals and the results of those meetings. Um, so it was it was a lot of um, a, a lot of pieces of information that was put together. That was all sent to the DOE in January. In April, we had a review with them, and as I said yesterday, we received the full report. And this report has a list of all the items they were looking for, the results of those, and the um, the things we do need to work on. So, Anita, if you want to go to the the next slide, there were 48 items, the criteria that were examined out of these selected files. And out of those 48, we were 100% compliant in 40 of them. In eight of the areas, we need to do some work. Now, again, these were randomly selected. So we might select an, another random group and it might be a little different. But um, this is this is how they conduct their their monitoring review. So if you can click on that link, Anita, please. I can't hear you. You're talking. It's it's not live. Um, oh, hold on, just a second. Let me see. Is that it? No. Actually, no, that's the things we need to work on. Um, Hold you, on. Let me, see, let me see if I can get. Yeah, I can't. Um, I can't copy and paste it. Oh, there we go. Hold on. Nope. It look, nope. It, mm. Was anybody able to? I did send the yeah. people, but not everybody could open them. Uh, Roz, I'm clicking on the link, but it sent me right back into email. I did. I can did you, see your deck as well as your um, Excel document. You've got an Excel document there? I do. Okay. Uh, can you share that? Sure. <laughs> sure. Sorry. I can't no. share anything off my computer. There's something wrong with it. So um, I'm no, kind of... I'll, I'll stop sharing and... Turn it over to you. All right. See if Tom can share it. And I hope there's nothing, um, no other names on, on there. Ooh, yeah. Um, let's see. All right. Hold on. It shouldn't be. There we go. All right. Conf 
Okay. This, yeah. All right. This is okay. I think this is the final. So I know this is difficult to see, but if you scroll down, it will go through all 48. And I will find a way to get this to you. Paul, I'm sorry. Um, and in, in here was the compliance in the, the right hand column where we had 40, uh, sorry, 40, 100 percent. And then the, oh no, the, sorry, you're not. This is the ones that we have to work on. Correct. I think yeah. that's the only tab I see. It Ron. is. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. So, all right. So we have to work on um, eight. The um, and most of these are around data. So the academic needs are in the IEPs and making sure that those academic needs um, match the evaluation that's also in the IEP. And then we're looking at the present levels and do the present levels match? And the data has to match exactly. Um, the goals, are they measurable? Do they make sense against the evaluation and the data and the, um, and the present levels? That's for the academics. And then we have the same things with the functional needs and the developmental needs. So again, the present levels, the data, are they all very well explained? And can they be linked through the IEP? Um, Ross, then, I have I have that in in I found it in another email that you sent me, and if um, Tom stops, oh, sharing, I will. Pick yeah, it. I will definitely stop. Go ahead. I'm glad I sent it multiple times. <laughs> okay, hold on just a second. It is called. There we go. Okay. That's, okay, this has the percentages. These are the areas we have to work on. Um, and as you can see, from what they looked at, this was the percentage of the documents I sent that did not have, or, or that, that were successful. But obviously we've got some areas to work. So the, um, we, would, we were going through the functional, then we're down to number seven, which is the related service, and again, what, they, what you cannot see is when you get to the related service, is there something that there's no mention of anywhere, anywhere else in the IEP? So is, are the related services that are recommended and proposed by the team, are they supported by the evaluation data? And are there goals to match those uh, services? And then the final one is the determination of eligibility within those 45 days, um, which we have 45 school days to actually go from um, permission to test to reviewing the evaluations. Um, so there were, there were some of the incidents where they had gone a little over. Um, so the, the great news in this, the team was very surprised because they said in, the, in all of the districts that they have been monitoring, this was the fewest amount of things to work on by far. So York's been doing a pretty good job with um, what the, the state expects for the compliance of the IEPs. Um, and uh, Anita, if you can go back to the, um, the little slide show. Yep, hold on just a second. Thank you. Okay, so that's slide two, that's slide three. This is just a list of uh, the things we have to work on. And the final slide I just put together, moving forward, what we're going to have to do here. We have until, um, we have until June the next year, 2022, to provide professional development for our staff and to provide the state with documentation that we have corrected these in another sample of, um, of materials. So we'll have some professional development. The state does offer some. We can do um, in-house or we can bring consultants in. Um, I like to have tabletop exercises where we have a group that have to analyze each section of the IEP 
and bring it up to speed. I find those very, very useful. Uh, district-wide calibration. So we're doing this district-wide and sharing it across schools. Um, and um, data collection. The data collection for the progress monitoring of the IEP goals. That's something that we uh, need to put a lot of work into. And again, we have one year. And I will just say, and I had got it on a slide, nothing in any of these um, is, is a sharing of information of whose IEPs they are. It's all very confidential. We, we black out the names and um, nothing, that, um, nothing that's shared on any of these with you could be identified. So I just wanted to make that clear. Any questions? <laughs> Roz, I have a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying that 40 out of the 48, we achieved 100% accuracy, correct? And so is there a cutoff when you don't have issues to work on? For example, do you have to be at 100 or can you be at 90? Or I'm just no, trying you're, to. You're at 100 or you're working on it. Okay. So you're 100 or you're working on it. So. Yeah. And the state has told you that the 40 is 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 darn good, you're saying. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They, they were surprised. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Brenda. Um Roz, can you some of these questions are just to sort of um, give some context to your presentation tonight. So can you share with the committee and the public approximately how many IEP um, IEP cases do we have or, or files? Um, we have around 245. Okay, so they're, all right, so they're looking at less than 10%. Yeah. Um, and then can you describe for the, um, especially for the new committee members, the, we have special ed um, administrators, like mid-level, if you will, in the buildings. Could you just describe that, that role for people? Yes. The, um, after a report was uh, done and, and um, a review of the special education a few years ago, um, that we, uh, the district appointed um, school level administrators. So we have Erin Conway, who is our elementary. Um, and right now we have Carla Gill at the middle school and Joelle Coleman at the high school. Um, through the budget, we are reducing that to two administrators mm -hmm. and myself so that's uh, three of us all together for a district this size that was what that was actually recommended in that report one of the reasons for that is you know, if, if you have more district-wide then you um you get more cohesiveness across mm -hmm. the district but also we, we took a really good look at the um the audit that that was completed in 2018 um, their, a big part of their role is um, to monitor compliance in their schools, which seems to me to have worked, and, um, and to be there to add consistency to the referrals, the eligibility, and the IEP process in each building. Um, apart from that, they are there to help develop programs and um, help um, with training staff and being there to answer the the continual questions that staff have that come up every day in special education. Thank you. Welcome. Meredith. Um, thanks, Roz. How does this how does this audit compare to the 2018 audit? Where, where is it is it the same group of people who did it and no. Same material? No. The, the 2018, I believe, was just brought in as a, a private um, a private group. I mean, that it, it's a group that monitors in a lot of states, actually. Um, mm -hmm. But they came in to really take a look at special education in the district. The the main DOE are looking at compliance and and the compliance of um, around the legal framework for the special education timelines and uh, the IEP, what what is involved in that. Um, so that's their main focus, rather than the structure of 
special education in the district. There was there was a main DOE audit in 2019, two years ago, but I'm not really sure what happened with those because then COVID hit during that year that they had to submit things. Um, so I was guessing that was why they came back again, although I did hear every time there's a new director, the main DOE come in and do an audit. So I'm really kind of not sure why this one came up this year. But well, do you know how do you know how these results compared with the prior audits the, of the prior similar ones? Not at this point, no. Yeah. Well, we can get that. I can I, absolutely get that. It's yeah. just that I, I just got this full report last sure. week. So. Sure. Oh, okay. So Meredith, I think I'm understanding your question. Do you want to try to compare apples to apples with the the the, the firm that we brought in in 2018? It was my first year. American Educational um, Consultants. They did a system wide assessment of special ed. But you want to compare, I think, the da data from this year to prior audits conducted by the main DOE, correct? Yeah, exactly, oh, yes. Let's take, get that. What we can do is get that information and get it out to the, the school committee. We can do okay. that. That'd be great, thank you. And then okay. also, Roz, just one more thing. Were you surprised by any of the areas of deficiency? Again, I know you I know you just got it. I, I absolutely get that. But when you look at that, when I see that 57.89% compliance, that's, you know, it's alarming. On the other hand, it's fewer than 10% or less than 10% of the, of the pool. But was there anything that was a surprise to you or stood out as like a alarming? Um, I think some of the um, some of the the strengths, the needs. Yes, I was a little surprised that some of that was so low. But um, generally, no, because like like you say, it was a very small sample. So you're missing three. You're missing, you know, sure percentage. So it's um. The, the number of files we submitted was based on the number of students that we had two years ago now. So that's how they work their numbers out. So they tell us how many files to submit. Um, but in my experience, in uh, even in New Hampshire, where I came from, um, when they did this kind of review, they came in and just randomly picked a few files. You know, it's not, um, they, they don't look at a large sample. So, okay. all right, thank you. You're welcome. Brenda? <clears throat> I just wanted to shed a little bit of um, light on what uh, Meredith was trying to get at. And I, I won't have the exact um, years, but I'll be within probably six months, correct? So, um, I, I think if you've followed the newspaper and the stories about uh, the York schools, <clears throat> you'll know that a, more than a handful of years ago, we were having a lot of um, due process uh, complaints filed at the state um, coming out of an IEP uh, cases. And that usually is initiated by parents or families. And so that prompted us in, I wanna say 2016, to actually invite the state to come in and do like a, an off cycle um, audit. So that information is, is somewhere to be found for sure. And um, while I can't quote you uh, the, the stats, I don't have those handy in my head, you will see that this is a marked difference um, from those results. And then our intention was to bring in um, a, a consulting firm to survey the program as Roz described, not necessarily for timeline and paperwork compliance, but you know what is how is the programming that we've put together serving um, serving our students' needs, and that ha we actually ended up holding off on doing that until we hired a new superintendent. So that became one of um, Lou's initial like larger tasks to tackle. Um, so that's been sort of our timeline. Um, and then I was going to ask Roz, but it sounds like you don't know what is what is the typical cycle? Is it every three years? But maybe we don't know that question I, i'm really not sure about that okay. um i it was every four years but then okay. this was kind of a two so i think it depends a lot on the results that oh. all right that's yeah. great thank you You're welcome anita did you have something no oh okay just reading your body language incorrectly then all right uh anyone else have any other questions for Roz? 
All right. Okay. The very last item under my section is um, uh, I've invited uh, Principal Francis and he's invited Melanie Kyer here to speak tonight uh, about um, uh, world languages exchange trips moving forward. So welcome, Melanie. And, and uh, Carl, I hope you can hear me. I know you're participating by phone. And uh, so are you there, Carl? You need to unmute. Okay, Melanie, how about, can you stand in? I absolutely can. I would have you here. <laughs> we didn't can you hear me okay? Oh, there you are, Carl, okay. There he is. Okay. Yeah. Melanie, I just wanted to uh, introduce Melanie. Um, Melanie Kyer, she is a German teacher at York High School and uh, has been highly involved in our our opportunities for kids to travel abroad and, and um, have students join us from Europe. And, uh, you know, I'm pleased to have her here tonight to talk about the program and also uh, talk a little bit about the future and kind of let you know what we're thinking and hopefully get your feedback and uh, hopefully some positive feedback on continuing this uh, for the next school year. So I'll turn it over to you, Melanie. Thank you very much, Carl. And I will try to keep this brief. I'm uh, respectful every time I have the opportunity to uh, attend a school committee meeting at just how hard you guys work and how many different things get thrown onto the docket. So um, I know you might be thinking this is kind of from left field. Why are we talking about international travel and the pandemic and all the other little details that have to happen? I hope I can very briefly convince you why um, we really kind of need to think about this far in advance. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you those reasons why I want to talk to you about that in the in uh, right off. And one of those is because, as we all know, um, you know, planning international travel has a lot of moving pieces and it takes a lot of time. Um, we also know that parents in the York School District plan their own vacations really far in advance. They're always calling the school to find out when the vacation calendar is, et cetera. So um, if we want them to have buy-in with us about uh, sending their children possibly to go abroad, um, we need to give them all the details as soon as possible because they're as nervous as we are. Um, secondly, um, travel, international travel is very expensive. Um, and so these days it's a crunch for everybody. And the sooner they can decide that they're gonna be taking an international trip, um, provides equity, I think, in a big way um, for all the families that might need that time to save up for a trip, at least that they're aware of that so they can make payments. Um, thirdly, it uh, gives us as a school department um, a chance to, um, well, or as, a, as a languages department, I should say, to vet the applicants. So we really want everybody to know what they're getting into. We want to be able to look at the kids who are planning on going and ask all their teachers, are these good candidates? Are these kids that are going to represent us well um, as they travel abroad, etc.? And that means that we ideally would want to be getting people on board a year in advance of doing that travel so that we have all that time. And of course, finally, it's um, an enrollment feature for the kids. It, it provides uh, relevance to them of their language study because they know that they can use that when they're traveling abroad. Um, it gets them excited about something starting right off into the school year. So um, for all of those reasons, um, I'm kind of here uh, with you very briefly um, to, to request kind of permission to move forward with the idea of potential travel um, next April and or depending on the language, because we have three languages that all have exchanges um, being host to students coming from abroad. And this is obviously all with the caveat that we don't have a crystal ball to know what things will look like in a year. So anything that we would tell to parents or any recruitment that we would do would be with that understanding that at any moment that could get pulled out from under us. And we know that, um, but it allows us to start planning. And that's the important thing that we can say, this is what we'd like to do. Obviously, if things go wrong, then that would get canceled, but you know that going into it. And we've worked with travel companies that are also very generous with their cancellation policies so that if we have that in place, we can take a look You know, every month moving forward and say, what does this look like? Is this going to happen or not? Last year, the French uh, 
um, languages were going to go to uh, visit their partner school. Um, and unfortunately, you know, right about the time we shut down, that was right when they were forced to cancel their trip over there. We as a German department were planning to go, um, well, you know, a couple of weeks ago, this past, past April, we never recruited kids for it because it actually, when I look back at that time capsule of my calendar, right when we shut down, the following week was going to be our interest meeting. We always meet, you know, March or April to try and gauge the interest of the students and get them all signed up. So from that standpoint, we're already a little late in planning a trip for next year. Um, but everybody understands that, right? And we, there's no way we could have tried to do that any earlier. But at this point, before we send kids off for the summer, we'd really like to have that spark of insight, excitement for them. Um, and that has to come with, with your um, okay. Um, very, very briefly, we do have a history of an exchange um, that goes back, German is the oldest, from before the time I was hired um, over 10 years ago. It's been about 15 years. Um, the uh, the spearhead of that was actually uh, Dieter Kuratza, who was himself an exchange student here in York many years ago. He's now the principal of our partner school and decided that, you know, he really wanted to bring kids back to York. So we've got a long standing relationship with that school. Um, they are very careful, of course, in their vetting of students. And we've been talking with them the whole time about how we can strengthen that. Um, but uh, we go over one year and then the following year they come to visit us and it's been happening really successfully for a very long time. The French department um, or the, the, uh, the French students have been going to a small town outside Paris um, and that's been happening for about five or six years as well. None of these exchanges are necessarily going to happen forever, but but having an exchange is so different from just, you know, going with a tour company to visit Paris and staying in five star hotels and really never getting to know students. So um, we've got kids that maybe I, they come back to me later and say, oh, yeah, I went to visit my host student that I was with five years ago and they still they come back and see us. And so, I mean, I could talk forever about that, which is not the purpose of tonight. But if you have questions, I'm happy to. So we work on that two year plan. We've already missed a couple of years. And, you know, if you're a family and you're planning a trip just on your own, you can put it off for a year, no problem. If you're a student in high school and you don't get that window, I've got kids that have missed the trip entirely because they were planning to go their senior year and oops, we're not going. Um, so it's really important to them to have that opportunity. Um, and we have, you know, if we're going every other year, this is our chance for those kids to get to go or they just aren't going to because next year will be too late and they'll be graduated. So it's important for us to try and get those numbers. What we are asking for you on behalf of the language department is just the permission to move forward with that caveat that we recognize situations could change um, and depending on numbers and rules and all of that sort of stuff that you could certainly at any time say, we would feel better if you didn't travel. Um, but it gives us time to do that planning and to recruit kids and have kids, you know, paying into their accounts so they can um, have a better feeling about being able to actually do that. So that was a lot. I um, hope that's kind of clear what we're asking and I'd be happy to entertain questions. Any questions? I saw Brenda's hand go up. Um, Tom has one too. Tom, go ahead. <clears throat> well, Melanie, uh, thank you uh, for that uh, information. It, re it reminds me of years ago when we actually did exchange students in our home back in the 90s. Um, that's going way back. So is this the program, though, that you're specifically targeting? Is this two schools working in tandem to share, like, exchange students? Right. Not Okay. So it's a little so what, different. What then. we do is is right. we um, we usually have around twenty kids or so in in uh, York that go over. Um, we travel for a couple of days to see the highlights on our own as a cohesive group, and then we're about four or five days in the homes of the host families of the exchange partners using their bathrooms and going with them to, you know, have they take us around, the families do, and um, they really get to experience what it's like in a home, which is very different than staying in a hotel. 
So it's not a full year or a, it's not a full No, school. no. This is this okay. is a trip, a school trip. And then right. those same kids that the kids stay with come back and we get to provide hospitality to them on our end. So it's a it's a two-way exchange that takes place over two years. And you know, it's it's one to one basically. Usually there are some kids who can only host or can only travel because of their home situations, but yeah, it, it usually is that kind of connection between families and between schools. Thank you. Brenda? I don't have a question. I just wanted to offer that um, both of my uh, both of my kids participated in the French exchange. So both went over and then we also received, you know, we hosted um, one. My daughter had graduated, so she didn't get to return that favor. Um, and it, it was a you know, great experience. So glad to have you here tonight. Thank you, Brenda. Any other questions? I think Meredith had her hand up earlier, or did you take it down? Oh, I took it down, but I just, Melly, I just wanted to say thanks so much for speaking about it so passionately also. It just, it's great to see the excitement. So thank you so much. It's a fantastic program. I mean, looking forward to seeing it happen, but it's good to hear you. Thanks. And um, Dave, I just wanted to mention that Melanie, one of my favorite memories in York was um, when the German students came, uh, I think it was in the fall, mm -hmm. uh, about 18 months or so ago. I, and I just remember being out there to greet them and then watching them get off the bus and the excitement in the faces of all the students and then watching them go and watch a football game and just, you know, being exposed to football in America. And it was just a beautiful thing. So thank you for all you do. And I, I appreciate you very much. Thank you so much, Lou. Um, and so we're excited. I think everybody's excited as little by little things open up at the possibility of being able to do these things. And I know even when we were in the middle of pandemic, I had parents say, but but when can we go? Like, when are you gonna be able to do this? So um, it's exciting to be able to hold out that for them of uh, something normal that might just happen, even if it's gonna be a long time from now. So Dave, I think what we're looking for is consensus from the school committee to move forward in the planning process, if that's possible tonight. Dave, do you want a formal motion or are we just giving thumbs up here? Uh, let's let's do it formally. Then Mary, we can come back to it and say, who? <laughs> oh, that was us. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll take a motion then. I'll, um, I move to approve the travel, international travel trips. And these are going to go, this is next year, Melanie, you said? Well, I guess I would clarify that um, depending on the language, I, in, in our language, we're planning to travel to Germany next April. Okay. Um, French is still kind of putting that into play, whether they would be traveling or hosting. Or receiving. Okay. Um, but I, I either way, we would be happy to cancel if at the last minute something happens. We just want to be able to start. Sure. I, I have a suggestion that you put it into motion, Bernard, that that you approved in the planning process and then for future trips to be formally approved by the school committee. Okay, so I move to approve the planning process for the international um, trips for the French and German students. Did Spanish doesn't do that? They, yes, I just, I, I'm much more familiar with that and Spanish is actually looking at going in a different direction with their travel and, and um, not having an exchange directly, but it's still international trips. So if we have right. approval to start recruitment on that, we're happy. Okay, for all our world languages then, thanks. Yes. Lou, can I, uh, Dave, can I get a clarification? Um, it's Carl. Yeah. Are we approving that they can travel next year or just starting no, to I, look into the process? I think, I think Carl, the recommendation is that the motion is that they're going to engage in the planning process. Once that process is completed, then they would come forward and ask for approval for the specific trips or the specific events. Does that make sense, Melanie? Is that what you're seeking right now? Well, I, if, if that's all we can get, we'll be happy. We do actually, we have already talked with Promotor and we have an itinerary for next spring. So we would like to be able to start that and then cancel it if it can't work. Um, because we'd like to be able to have kids be able to budget that and plan that as soon as possible. But um, if if you don't feel comfortable with allowing kids to sign up, we can take the first step and try and get at least a, a letter of interest from everyone. So Lou, I think your sequence would have us approving it after the kids have paid and committed to it. And, and that might be a little risky. That's all, no, that's all. So what, I, I, 
I'm just trying to identify, do you have a specific recommendation for where you're going? Yes, yes. Our, our current uh, itinerary yeah. has us traveling to, um, okay. to Salzburg, Austria for a couple of days. And then I think, and then we go out to our, to our home school, our partner school is in Oberzon. So okay. we, we do okay. a little bit of tourist travel and then we're with our partner school um, just outside Stuttgart. Um, okay. And that would be during April vacation. So I, I guess what you're looking for then is approval of these trips contingent upon it being safe for students to travel. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. So I'm going to rescind my motion since I'll, I'll try it third time can be a charm. I move to approve the planning and the travel for the 2021-2022 school year and 2022-2023 school year for our world language department. Second. I'll second. Any other discussion or questions? I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Melanie. And thank, thank you so much. I'm sorry for the complicated, uh, convoluted structure of the question, but we I'm, just, uh, we're, we're very happy to have your approval. So I'm just glad we did it in English. <laughs> thank you, Bean. No problem. All right. Thank you. I will let you carry on. Have a good night. All right. Now we've come to public comment. We have, uh, I have received several emails. Bear with me while I pull them out of my in basket and read them. Uh, school committee questions. This is from... Julie Edminster, dear school committee members, one, when will these school committee meetings be in person so we can participate live during public comment? Two, when will the children as young as five be allowed to play outside and inside without masks at York schools? And three, many York high school students are vaccinated. Why can't they go to school without masks five days per week? There is a significant lack of learning this year, especially among the freshmen. I will answer number one. We will be in the library live and in person at our next meeting on 16 June. Uh, the other questions, we have a, a, a number of mass questions that I'm going to read all the questions first and then we'll respond. Do, do, do. This one's from Gloria Mara. Good evening. I understand there's a school committee meeting this evening, and I was hoping to ask a question that could possibly be addressed. I've done an extensive amount of research on all things COVID over the past year, especially pertaining to our youth. I've learned that children are the least likely, in fact, close to 0% chance of becoming seriously ill from COVID. That being said, masking our children seems to have done more harm than good. My question is, could you please provide the science proving that masking our children does more good than harm? Thanks so much. There are more. This is from Nina Wright, dear school committee members. In a letter I wrote this week to the superintendent and Ms. Hutchins asking about masks usage outside when the mandate was repealed, the response left me feeling we are heading in the wrong direction when it comes to our children. The reason they stated was lack of school days, social distancing difficulties, and unvaccinated children. We as a community had no idea what this pandemic would look like. After 15 months and documentation behind us, it is safe to say children and those under 70 are extremely safe from this virus. In fact, we have a 99.97 chance of survival from COVID, and there are therapeutics that can save lives that the drug companies have tried to silence. No amount of social distancing or masks or vaccines can make these results any better, nor did they. The emergency use of vaccines are a trial on the public. There have been 763 deaths in Maine from COVID, and no one under the age of 20 has died from COVID in Maine. 
to infer that our children need to be injected with an emergency authorized biological agent that we don't know the long-term effects of is criminal. Additionally, the use of masks on children is child abuse and is contrary to any science. I ask you to follow the science and data and stop the uses of masks on our children and school staff. I also implore you to not coerce the children and staff to take an emergency use authorized vaccine of which have caused over 4,000 deaths since December in the U.S. alone. As educators, we rely on you and your profession to critically think, do what is best for the children and not follow your own ideologies and to be open and curious, tell the facts and truth about this pandemic. Coercing our children and staff to be vaccinated and wear masks does more harm than good. If we lose one child to this experimental vaccine in York, that cost is too high to pay. Regards, Nina Wright. I thought I had one more. Since we've been not streaming, I've gotten several emails complaining about the lack of streaming. I'll not read those. We will respond. I will respond individually to those emails. They were suggesting that we cancel the meeting, postpone it until it can be viewed by the public. When in fact it will be viewed by the public uh, when we get this posted on town hall streams. Now, Superintendent, the masking uh, so dilemma. Yeah. So with regard to the, the science, I will take that information and share it with the consulting uh, folks that um, we work with at the main Department of Health and Human Services. And I also share it with the nursing consultant at the main DOE to find out I'm not the scientist here. Um, I don't have uh, the facts and figures to share at this moment in time, but I'm willing to share that information with the state officials who provide the requirements that we need to follow. Um, I will tell you that from the get-go on this pandemic, I followed the advice of the experts, the health experts, uh, and the uh, policy folks that um, work with the governor at the Department of Education. Um, so in terms of us not masking, uh, that if we, we, we were to take masks away from students in, in person, in class, uh, we'd probably be the first in the state of Maine to do that. That's not the recommendations or the requirements right now with the Maine Department of Education. If we don't go along with that advice, we do lose the chance of receiving additional funding for to combat COVID. In terms of the immunizations, they're opt-in. Uh, we do not coerce uh, students to uh, be immunized. Never have, never will. Uh, that's, a, that's a decision that parents make on behalf of their child and guardians make on behalf of their children. Um, so all I can say is I will share the, the scientific questions with those who uh, uh, are better prepared uh, to answer. Uh, certainly we'll do that. I'll share it with the MDOE. I'll share it with the, uh, the uh, Maine Department of Health and Human Services and uh, try to get back as soon as I can with those responses. Again, with regard to the immunizations, uh, we're not forcing that. Um, I will remind folks that in 2009, when we had the swine flu pandemic, uh, we offered immunizations at the, York High, at the York School Department, as well as many other school districts across the state of Maine. Uh, so this isn't new. Um, so um, that's all I can say at this moment in time. I'm really not prepared to get into all the nitty gritties. Okay, that's fine. We will, we want to only deal with facts. All right, so we will move to our new business. We have uh, teachers appointments. Yes, I have uh, four appointments. I want to say that we've been working fast and furious to stay ahead of the curve and hiring the appropriate personnel uh, for the upcoming school year. Uh, we've had a high number of applicants for all the positions that we've posted. I'm really pleased with the um, efforts that have been made uh, by the um, administrators in each of the buildings, as well as their teachers who, who volunteer to serve on interview committees. Uh, the four candidates that I'm going to present tonight, I have personally met. I make it a point to meet everyone, every new hire that comes uh, 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 to the districts. If I'm going to nominate them, I need to know who they are. Uh, all references have been checked. 
Um, and um, so I'm going to move forward with three uh, with four nominations. Uh, the first nomination tonight is a woman by the name of Samantha Elgin. Uh, she's being recommended uh, to the position of a uh, village elementary school grade one teaching position. Uh, she's filling Megan Greer's vacancy. Uh, Samantha uh, has has experience in ele early elementary education in Maine and taught for one year in Thailand. She is currently a kindergarten teacher in Naples, Maine. The references describe her as having very positive relationships with students and their families and with staff. Uh, Samantha was interviewed by Beth and her team at Vest and by me. So I'm placing Samantha Elgin uh, in nomination for your approval for the position of Vest grade one teacher. Do you want a motion, Dave? I do. Okay. I move to approve the superintendent's nomination of Samantha Elgin to a first year probationary teaching contract as grade one teacher at the Village Elementary School for the 2021-2022 school year. I'll second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes, motion carries 5-0. Um, the second nomination tonight is a woman by the name of Colby uh, Rubo. Um, she's our selection for, for another best grade one teaching position. We'll be replacing Catherine Sherman, who is retiring. Um, Colby began her teaching career in Texas in 2013 and currently works in York as a long-term substitute teacher in grade K and special education. Uh, Roz has received excellent references for Colby when she was hired in her in her in January of this year. Uh, she has been interviewed by Roz, Beth, and by me. So I will please I'm pleased to place in denomination Colby Rubo for the second best grade one teaching position. I move to approve the superintendent's nomination of Colby Rubo to a first year probationary teaching contract as grade one teacher at the Village Elementary School for the 2021-2022 school year. I'll second. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair sure votes yes, motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Uh, the third nomination is um, Alex York. Uh, she's going to, I'm recommending her to the new position of the kindergarten teacher at VEST for next year. Alex holds a master's in elementary education and currently works in the Portsmouth, uh, in the Portsmouth schools as a long-term substitute teacher. Um, Alex is described as a teacher with natural instincts and one who validates children, encouraging them to be independent she was interviewed by Beth and her team and by me, and I'm pleased to present to you in nomination Alex York to be uh, Beth's uh, kindergarten teacher for next year. I move to approve the superintendent's nomination of Alex York to a first year probationary teaching contract as kindergarten teacher at the Village Elementary School for the 2021 to 2022 school year. I will second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes, motion carries 5-0. Thank you, and the last name I will place in nomination is uh, Nancy Philbrick uh, for the K through four math coach. Um, Nancy has a wealth of experience. Uh, she's our recommendation for the K four math coach for the upcoming school year. Um, Nancy is certified uh, math recovery specialist and has participated in the Maine Department of Education's Math for Me initiative, uh, the Balanced Leadership Institute at the Maine Math and Science Alliance, and the Governor's Academy for Math and Science Leaders. She previously taught um, in, South, in the South Portland and Oxford Hill School Districts since 2014, has worked as a K-6 through math coach for the Lewiston Public Schools. Um, Nancy was interviewed by Anita and me, and we are very excited to have her join uh, us in this role. So again, Nancy Philbrick placed in nomination for the K through four math coach. 
I move to approve the superintendent's nomination of Nancy Philbrick to a first year probationary teaching contract as a K-4 math coach for the York schools for the 2021 to 2022 school year. A second. Oh, please, Don. Sorry. Any second. discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Don? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5 0. I have no other recommendations. Uh, correct. Nothing uh, that we need to vote on. So now we're on to policies, first reads. Okay. Um, so just to sort of uh, set the scene here for <clears throat> Tom and Don. So the, um, so our district has, I'm going to guess, about 180 policies, and we are supposed to get through them on a three-year cycle. Um, when Julie Eneman and myself inherited the leadership role, we recognized that that work had not been done for decades. Um, and so we have taken four years to do our three-year cycle because that was the best we could do under the circumstances. So we're kind of hitting a reset button. Um, we actually started it last year. So we did all of our J policies with the exception of a few that we need to regroup with Eric over the summer with um, related to technology. Uh, but I've kind of developed a sort of a scope and sequence for us to get through. So typically you'll see policies that are about three years old, um, but the ones that we're starting with, it feels like we're starting too soon, but it's so that I can get them back into the pipeline at the correct time. So apologies. The good news is um, that means we don't have to do extensive research about these policies because they're not 20 years old anymore. Um, and so you might find that um, we move fairly quickly through some of them. Things that are related to students and staff oftentimes have a lot of case law that comes up and begins to shape some of the new policy recommendations. That's unusual to happen around board governance, which is section B. So we're gonna, we'll tackle that at some point this year. And I started us, I tried to do some easy Ks that don't, you know, they, they're, they're not really, um, they're not heavily known to be um, based in law in the truest sense, like where statutes are changing. Um, so I'm gonna introduce each policy. It, you guys are sort of, um, your role is to look for anything, anything you have questions about. I present them, but I'm not um, the expert on them. Like we all own these policies. <laughs> so I will do the best I can to fill you in as you kind of get into this um, routine. Um, but anything that you see that's even something that's like a typo, because uh, there's a lot of policy that comes in front of me and sometimes you just become word blind. Um, and that might be the case tonight because we've got a big chunk of them. So with that, uh, I will get us started. I'll try to do them in order. All right, so our first one is policy KBF and that's parent involvement in Title I. And, um, you know, again, this is this is a newer policy. So um, the highlights of this is really the issue of um, public communication and um, soliciting feedback from from our parent um, or our school, our family, uh, families that participate. So if you have any questions about either how that works or anything about the policy itself, we can entertain those. I and, just have a question. Sure. And well, I, I well, have, so oh, Dave, sorry. you, I was just say, Dave, you make sure, I'm looking at policy, I'm not looking at my screen, so you make sure you call. Okay. okay, go ahead. Actually, I just wanna check, are, are you gonna read each of them and then we ask questions or just, Jump in on it. No. Oh my gosh, we would be here okay. for a really long time. No, this is not enough, but, Good question. Um, on, I just have a question on, on KBF. Yeah. Um, when it says for the purpose of this policy, parents slash guardians includes other family members involved in supervising the child's schooling. Is that just people that are, are 
legally involved or or just any person that's that's been identified as being involved, whether that be by the family or the school system. I might ask Anita to jump in because I think we're actually referring to Title One. Title I One, but also who who is it we're collecting sort of feedback from? Can you think of I know you're on mute. Can you think of an example of someone that wouldn't be a parent or guardian? Well, we do collect feedback from, I mean, broad, in the broadest of senses, in the broadest of ways, we collect feedback from the entire community when it comes to our Title I supports, right? So we reached out this spring and we asked all of um, anyone in the parent community and anybody in the public to uh, inform how we use our, our federal dollars to um, support struggling students and um, support teacher learning. Um, so, but, but, but generally when it comes to individual students, it is those individuals that are um, guardian, parents or guardians. The legal, yeah, the legal. Right. Just wanted to clarify that, okay. But that's a, let's, let's take this as a learning point here for our mm -hmm. policy reviews, because we're gonna do a lot of them. That's all we do. I mean, yeah. that's not all we do, but we do a lot of them. So Dawn, in this case, if you have a question about that and you do, and we're not able to answer it on the spot here, that might prompt us to look at it more closely and come back in the second read, and then it'll be lined out and have some color font or something. So th that, that's all good. Don't, don't be shy. Don't be bashful about asking those kinds of questions because like Brenda said, there's uh, over 180 of these things. So, so we're not experts on any of them. And it takes a little time to research them. And just to put in a advanced plug for our last item, we're always looking for policy committee members. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> I'm here by default. So I'm happy to give up a seat for sure. All right. So sorry to interrupt there. But uh, any more on any more comments on KB? Okay, then we're probably ready for a motion. Yes. I'll move to, uh, I motion to move uh, policy KBF, parent involvement in Title I for a second read. I'll second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote, Brenda. Yes. Dawn. Yes. Tom. Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5 0 to move it to a second read. That brings us to policy KCB, community involvement in decision making. Um, and this basically captures um, the, the manner in which we survey or bring the greater community into um, feedback on our, our school programming. So you'll see that for sure as we get our strategic planning underway. That's a pretty easy um, example to point to. But obviously, folks are asked to participate at each one of our meetings as well. This one's a quick, quick one. Uh, we, we also have administrative uh, uh, committees that invite uh, community members to participate. I've had a longstanding administrative committee called the um, Communication Advisory Group. Uh, I know we have um, folks on the um, inclusion advisory group. So we do um, try to encourage uh, community participation at different um, committee levels, including administrative levels. Any other questions or comments on that policy? All right, let's move it. Uh, I'll motion to, to move policy KCB, community involvement in decision making, for a second read. I second it. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes, motion carries 5 0 to move it to a second read. That brings us to policy KCD, public gifts or donations to the schools. Um, the York committee, the school committee is sort of the, the agent, so to speak, that accepts um, 
money or property that is a donation sort of like above a certain a certain level which is why we have a standing um item on our agenda so this is also again a short short policy any questions or comments on this one okay I move to move policy KCD public gifts donations to the schools for a second read. I second. second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair sure votes yes. Motion carries 5 0. Move it to a second read. Um, okay, started you all off with some easy ones. So the next one is policy KE, general communications and or concerns. This is a policy that um, speaks to school committee members roles and we'll do deal with some of that in the training next, next week. Um, but it really just sort of identifies the idea of a chain of command um, and where the division lies. School committee folks interact with the superintendent and I'll just say, generally speaking, we don't just reach out um, to principals or staff to sort of resolve issues. That isn't to say you won't have um, communication at that level, but it's if it's an issue, it, it, it's the general rule of thumb for us, if we're receiving any issue, is that it's communicated to the superintendent so he is in the know, um, and that we direct folks that happen to catch you in a parking lot or at this, you know, at a field or something like that, that you direct them to the point of contact as close to the issue. Any questions or comments on that policy? I'll move to move KE, policy KE, general communications and or concerns for a second read. I'll second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5 0 to move it to a second read. That brings me to policy KG civility. Um, and this typically lies sort of in the, um, the offices at the school the school buildings in terms of managing any disruption to either staff or students. I'll make a motion to move policy KG uh, civility for a second read. A second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5 0 to move it to a second read. And our, I think it's our last one. Yep. Our last one is KI visitors to the school. And this is kind of a partner one with the civility, um, with the civility policy itself. And while awaiting any discussion, I will um, I make a motion to move policy KI visitors to the school for a second read. I'll second it and we can open up for discussion if needed. Any discussion or questions on KI? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes, motion carries 5-0 to move KI to a second read. Thank you. Before we move off of policy, I'll just say if for any reason um, you didn't do your you know, crash course <laughs> um, speed reading through all of the policies um, before the meeting, you are more than welcome to digest that and just reach out to me um, in terms of, again, if you find anything that's wonky or that you have more questions. And if, if it warrants sort of research or restructuring anything, I'll make those notes and um, we can bring it forward for discussion um, at our next meeting because we will be looking at these same policies. But I'll also be bringing you some new first reads too. So 
don't get too far behind on your policy reading. It gets a little rough um, in certain times of the year. We'll take a break during um, budget season though. All right, I will uh, take a motion to extend us beyond 9 p.m. I move to extend our meeting beyond 9 p.m. for the purpose of finishing up our agenda items. I will second. Any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Don? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair sure votes yes. Motion carries 5-0. I'd like to say we're trying to corral the topics we put on the agenda and limit them, but it seems like there's no end and we're not belaboring anything. I don't think we're just trying to do our business and uh, have, have people understand how we're operating and that is making us run over two hours. But I um, look back and shake my head at some of those other old minutes where they were one hour and 15 minute meetings. Maybe it's us. Maybe it's me. I don't know. Okay. I think That's it was the summertime. Usually the yeah. summertime, we'll, we'll, we tighten it up a little bit. And pandemic has been a little wonky for us. So. Yeah. All right. So on to uh, H, administrators reports. Hey, thank you this evening. Uh, we'll do our bills and payroll. Got an accounts payable uh, for 3 June of $744,000. $251.22, a payroll of May 27th, $842,123.20 for total bills and payrolls of $1,586,374.42. I move to approve the total bills and payroll in the amount of $1,586,000. $374.42. I'll second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5 0. That's all you have, Zach? Uh, if you want coming attractions, uh, we hope to actually get the FY20 audit um, sometime in the next week. So hopefully I can at least um, bring that up at the next meeting. And of course, that'll mean scheduling a, a joint meeting between the committee, select board, budget committee, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Um, old and unfinished business. We do have our committee, subcommittees or assignments and uh i i don't do not want to make assignments tonight this is just to familiarize the new members and uh whet their appetites as to what they might want to volunteer for before we make assignments i'm not going to make assignments if you don't want to participate in one of those committees but uh, we'll just run through them quickly if you're looking at the same document i am the first one is bills and payrolls where a number of us receive in advance of what Zach just told us we were going to authorize the entire ledger of what we're spending money on this morning or this, this week, it was 28 pages of a PDF. You just go through and review. And if anything catches your eye, like why are we buying Cupid dolls for the third graders? You know, you ask a question, otherwise you tell them, that you don't have any questions. Um, and then we also have to sign the bills, sign the bills and, and payroll uh, vouchers that are used to, to actually get the money from the town coffers to, uh, to pay our bills. So that's bills and payrolls. Um, capital planning, um, this is a meeting where we attend, or a meeting we attend with the Board of Selectmen representatives and um, other departments from the from the town, and we go through the five year plan. What's going to be in the capital plan for the coming year, and then eventually at the end of the budget cycle, those get manufactured into a <coughs> warrant article that goes on our our budget referendum in uh, May, like we just had. So there are a number of meetings throughout the year, not particularly onerous. 
uh, Zach will also usually attend those to, to provide the, the nitty gritty details, but uh, it's good for a school committee member and required to have a school committee member uh, on the capital planning meeting. They're asking for two this for. Yeah, I, yeah, I saw that. So we'll need two. Tom, you're volunteering? Not so fast. <laughs> Not so fast. All right, we'll take that under advisement. Um, let's see, negotiations. Uh, we are, in fact, actively negotiating with the, uh, the York Teachers Association. This coming fall, we'll have the uh, York uh, Support Bargaining Unit uh, agreement to start negotiating. Um, that's not for the weak of heart. Uh, not that either of you are weak of heart, but uh, that's what we do in the negotiations. Um, <clears throat> YTA liaison, we're no longer in that when we don't think because we've changed that article in the negotiations process. Um, regional technical center, I don't think there's a lot of interfaces there, <clears throat> Meredith. Yeah, that's mostly right. Um, Go ahead. Mostly tracking the graduation um, and, and attending usually once or twice a year. You'll Kind of yeah. to do that. It's making sure it doesn't go off our radar. It hasn't yeah. been that active due to the COVID. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> All right. What's the next one? Uh, PPG. Oh, policies. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> policies. Yeah, this one is uh, definitely active and definitely a uh, uh, not a ton of work, but work that needs to be done and there's a subcommittee that uh, the superintendent's on and uh, the school committee members yeah, and we have whoever else we need to answer questions about the policies that are under review and under revision so uh, think carefully before sticking your paw up for that one i'm hoping tom or don will arm wrestle for this one well i will just say we will because probably... it would be good to have a new member on the policy be. committee i would love well, to do that Okay, because we will we'll need to that that's a little bit on the job training. Um, I don't want to give away any secrets here, but I won't I won't be doing that next year. So, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, again, we're just trying to familiarize yourselves with what mm -hmm. so familiarize you with what's on the what these um, committees uh, entail. The PEPG steering. That's if we would are uh, going to revise the. Uh, professional performance handbook for the uh, teachers. Uh, I don't think that's particularly active, although with COVID, we did have to have a, a meeting. I think there are some routine reviews that are also being done. So yeah. that it's it's not dormant, but it's not, uh, not an every week kind of thing. Uh, Legislatively, yeah, it's not us. Uh, town Energy, um, we participate in that. Um, adult education advisory, Brenda. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, that's only if she needs something for um, nice. for for her. Like if she has to, I'm thinking of it like um, sometimes she has to have a community meeting committee oh, okay. that sanctions some stuff. So that's okay. a on call. I don't recall being called. All right, Tom, you have a question? The, uh, I don't know if we address sick bank. Is that something we, the sick? Yeah, um, yeah we're, no, we're not on that. We're not, okay. Why it's on there. Right. Okay, just want to be sure. All right. Yeah. Good question. And I keep flipping to the wrong screen here. Uh, strategic planning by, uh, I'm on, I, I am by, Default. The, the chair default on that one. The building committee uh, right now, I don't think we have any building in the immediate future. Inclusion advisory, it was uh, Anita and I was a representative on that. Athletics and activities advisory. Oh, yeah, there we need both of them filled. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Lou, you can describe that. So this committee was created a couple of years ago. Um, to, uh, and it's composed of school committee members, um, a school administrator, the athletic director, um, uh, and principal and some others uh, to really uh, address issues that might come up related to athletics. Uh, and so it's been a real great committee to have in terms of uh, looking at athletic policy, procedures, 
uh, any new sports that might come our way gets vetted through this committee. It's a real good committee to, to serve on if one of you choose to do so. Then I'm looking at new representation. Um, it's a great committee to be on. Um, and we meet probably once, once, or once a month it, it, uh, for about an hour or so. It's not too long. Uh, but uh, I'd appreciate it if uh, uh, we had a new member on, on that as well. Um, I'll join. Okay. Thank you, Tom. You know, Tom, this is being recorded. <laughs> okay. Dave, yeah, I know. I'm already busted for the other All one, right. too. Okay. Uh, the last one was... That's the Transportation Committee. Transportation. Uh, <laughs> this was in, in uh, regards to what, as we were changing from um, dropping off at every door to group stops and whether or not those stops were safe, but it continues today as our routes are gonna probably change with more busing going on next year, we hope, so that if a, a stop, if a parent has a concern about a stop, um, it, they can bring it to the transportation committee. Um, Zach uh, will go out with the uh, uniformed policeman of the York Police Department and take a look at the stop and, and evaluate it from a safety uh, perspective. Uh, as will the Ledgemere people, and then we come back and have a meeting about it, and uh, the parents can come in and uh, plead their case um, as to whether or not that's a safe stop or we they might need another stop on a particular route. So it sounds like a lot of work, but it's usually right at the beginning of the year or if we have to make a change to a route sometime during the year. So uh, that's what that's about. Uh, the I'm looking at the document, not the questions here. Okay. the. The last four at the bottom um, are just sort of like a, and I'll use an old term, like a big brother, or big sister to that school. Um, so if the principal has something that they want to talk to a school committee member about, not cutting the superintendent out, but it's just, you'll, you'll learn how this gets used as you go through the year. But uh, if you, uh, the principal wants to talk to uh, a school committee member. This is the one they go to. Uh, this actually was very, very active at the beginning of last year, at the end of the summer and the beginning of the year, as each building tried to work its way through how they were going to structure their their learning models and the health and and apply the health and safety uh, guidelines. Uh, we were actively involved sitting on those committees with our, you know, our, our big brother, big sister uh, schools. So that's what that's about. All right. And at the next meeting, we'll put this on here again, and then we'll actually put your name down, Tom, when you say I want to volunteer for that. But if anything did super strike you, um, you can always email Dave so that you claim your spot as soon as you possibly can. I'm one of those excited. Yeah, there's not usually a lot of competition for these positions, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lord. Uh, all right, um, Anita, have we had any phone comments come in? We Probably because we're not broadcasting, not. but. Right, we have not. But it's on the agenda, so. All right, so where are we? I've lost my agenda. All right, so okay. now. Go ahead, Lou. So, Zach, can you stay with us? Because we're going to go into a brief executive session. I promise it will be brief. And um, then we're going to come out. And so you stop the recording. And then we're going to come out. And then there's going to be a vote taken in public session. All so right. I would need uh, the five uh, committee members, Zach, myself, and Carl is going to join us. Uh, okay. And, um, Liz and Sue, you can hang around to record the final vote. And Anita, you can go get a cookie and some milk or whatever, tea, no. and good night. For, for Sue and Liz, I usually email them the minutes. Okay. They, don't have, okay. yeah, they don't have to stay for the meeting. So they all can go get some tea and cookies if they want. Okay. Yeah. All right. I will entertain a motion to move into executive session. I move to close the public meeting. I second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Dawn? Yes. Tom? Hold it. No, you rest.
Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5 0 to leave public session and enter executive session. And I right. now, well, now I move that we enter into executive session in accordance with Title I MRSA Section 405, um, subsection 6A for personnel. I'll second. Any discussion? Saying none, I'll call for a vote. Brenda? Yes. Sean? Yes. Tom? Yes. Meredith? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion carries 5 0 to enter executive session. Thank you. And, I, and I'll move this one along. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording. If you give me just a second here. No problem. I'm sorry, Zach. Yep. How do I stop it? There we go. I see the recording.